Good afternoon. My name is Ron Richwall, President of the Danira Association. I have much pleasure in welcoming all participants on behalf of the Danira Association and Emmanuel Synagogue Sydney. This is the second of our virtual Zoom events commemorating the 60th anniversary of the arrival of the Danira boys and the Queen Mary Singapore families. We are proud that the Queen Mary Singapore group are a part of the Danira Association. And so we present this event on the work of Carl Duldig and the Duldig Studio. Our co-host Marina Caponi from Emmanuel Synagogue will shortly advise you of today's program. Our main presenter is Eva de Jong Duldig. As a child, she was transported from Singapore with her family on the Queen Mary to Sydney and onto an internment camp in Tatura, where, the, where some of the De Niro boys were also interned. In July 1940, all German and Italian enemy aliens then resident in Singapore were told they were to be expelled. Originally refugees from their German and Austrian homelands, these families had arrived in Singapore holding German passports, fleeing their own government's policies and actions. 295 internees, 232 Jewish refugees and 63 Italian or German nationals left Singapore on the 18th of September guarded by 42 soldiers of the Gordon Highlander Regiment on the Queen Mary. And on the 25th of September, they arrived in Sydney. From there, the Queen Mary Singapore group were transported for internment to Tatura. In February 1942, with the increased threat from Japan, which had entered the war in December 1941, a number of the men from the internment camps were allocated to work on farms picking fruit. Later, they were allowed to enlist in the 8th Employment Company of the ADF and their wives and children were also permitted to leave internment. I now have much pleasure in inviting our co-host Marina Caponi, Project Manager of Emmanuel Synagogue Sydney, our co-host who will outline today's program. Marina. Thank you, Ron. Thank you very much and thank you everyone and how wonderful so have you all joining us. Um, before I do um, talk about the program, it's extremely important to us here at Emmanuel to um, do an acknowledgement of our traditional landowners. We acknowledge the traditional owners of the land, the Gadigal clan of the Eora Nation. We walk with respect on the land that sustains the spirit of our First Nations and pray that together we can heal the wounds of past wrongs. May we learn the truth of our intertwined history, empower our First Nations voice within the constitution and strive to share equitably in the bounties of the nation we share. We walk together towards the future, amen. So I'd like to welcome everybody. And as Ron said, yes, I am the Programming Director at Emmanuel Synagogue. And how wonderful um, to do this event once again, our second event with the Danero Association, but even more special because we have the Dual Dig Studio so um, with us. I think um, if I may, just before I introduce and tell everybody there, are, you have some wonderful, wonderful people speaking today. Um, you will be hearing from Lyndall Wisher, who is the director of the Dual Dig Studio. Um, so Lyndall is a fascinating woman who's an arts manager and a curator with over 20 years experience in the Australian museum and gallery sector. Um, many, she's worked at the Shepherd and Art Museum um, and a collection advisor for some of Melbourne's major art and public art collections. So um, Linda will be speaking later. We also will have fascinating woman, Janet, who has also a musical interlude for us. And um, Janet Arndt is um, the, a wonderful guide at the Dual Dig Studio. And I do hope that once the restrictions are all lifted and we can travel safely, that you will all go to the studio and Janet um, will be there to guide you all. Um, Janet's parents were also in Singapore and Tatura. And I understand that Janet is also the treasurer, if that's correct, Janet, of the Danera Association. Eva is the founder of the Dual Dig Studio, including the museum and the sculpture garden. 
um, a public museum which is dedicated to the preservation and conservation of the Dig family history. Um, well, my name is Eva de Jong Dig, and I think Marina was going to tell you that I'm the founder of the Dig studio in Melbourne. And it gives me great pleasure today to speak to you and to thank Marina and Ron for the opportunity to be able to speak to you on this very interesting subject. I hope you'll all find it interesting. The subject is survival through sculpture and the art of my father, Carl Dulde. In this brief glimpse into Carl's art, today's talk focuses on the Jewish context and the impact of his work on future generations. Carl was born in Przemysl, Poland in 1902 and moved to Vienna with his family in 1913. At 19, when this photo was taken, he was already an outstanding soccer player and also a gifted emerging artist. His father used to say, I have two decent sons. Carl's brothers were both lawyers and one who is an artist. In 1921, Carl became a student of the eminent Austrian sculptor Anton Hannach at the Kunstgewerbeschule, School of Applied Art in Vienna. One of his first works under Hannach was this mask in Salzburg marble. Hannach selected this sculpture to represent the Kunstgewerbeschule in an international exhibition in Munich. From the beginning, Carl was interested in portraiture and surprisingly enough, one of his first portraits was of a rabbi. Rabbi Tzvi Peretz Hayes was very progressive in his attitude and agreed to sit for the young Jewish sculptor. Later, he became chief rabbi of Austria and this head was exhibited in an important World Jewish Conference held in Vienna. Unfortunately, the present whereabouts of the marble bust are unknown but the Dordic studio has the original terracotta in its collection. In 1996, a bronze cast of this terracotta on your screen was acquired by the Jewish Museum Vienna. Carl met my mother, Slava Horowitz, while they, they were both students of Anton Hanna. And here we have a photo taken in Anton Hanna's studio. It shows the students at a coffee break with their professor, Carl is, seated. Carl is seated at the front on the left and Slava in the middle with a white bandana. The next image is taken in the student's studio. It shows Slava almost hidden behind her life-size marble sculpture while near her, Anton Hanak is mentoring her work. It was while Slava was studying at the Academy of Fine Arts that she invented the modern foldable umbrella. Here are the specifications for her ingenious invention, part of the worldwide patent, which was approved on the 19th of September, 1929. This image shows some of the items she used in putting together the prototype of her little umbrella, as well as later manufactured examples. She called the umbrella flirt. The flirt umbrella was manufactured under license in Austria and Germany and earned her royalties till she fled from Austria in 1938. This photo of my parents was taken in Vienna around 1933 and shows Slava proudly holding her umbrella. I was born in Vienna on the 11th of February, 1938. And one month later, Hitler marched into Vienna and our lives would be changed forever. The portrait bust on the screen is of Ernst Speck, a Swiss immigration official. In appreciation of his help in securing the papers needed to enable my mother and I to leave Vienna, my father modeled his portrait in clay. I owe my survival to this man and this sculpture. The video you are about to see tells in part the story of our escape, our journey to Australia 
and the subsequent internment in Tatura. In 1938, my parents, Karl and Slava Duldig and I, fled from our Austrian homeland and went to Switzerland. This was followed by a journey to Singapore, where my parents established a very successful art school and where my father, Karl, had some amazing commissions. This very happy period, however, came to an abrupt end in September 1940, when the British classified everybody holding Austrian or German papers as enemy aliens, and on short notice we were sent for internment to Australia. Together with about 250 other internees, we left Singapore on the luxury liner Queen Mary, which had been converted into a troop ship. Our second class cabin was very comfortable and, apart from the fear of encountering a Japanese submarine, we could well have been on a holiday cruise. Our arrival in Sydney was reported in the Sydney Morning Herald on the 28th of September 1940. Luxury internees have disembarked in Sydney on their way to a country internment camp. Our hope for parole in Sydney was dashed when we were taken in a heavily guarded train and in trucks to an internment camp situated in northern Victoria, halfway between Rushworth and Tatura. Everybody was shocked by the primitive living conditions. My parents slept on straw palliuses in a tiny room, one of 12 identical rooms in a galvanised iron-clad hut. A camp leader was elected and two days after our arrival, the first of many letters of appeal for release was sent to the Australian Prime Minister, Robert Menzies, and to the Governor-General. It read in part, We represent 67 men, 75 women, 24 children under 15 years of age, and 42 bachelors. All of us are Jewish refugees from Nazi oppression from German-occupied territories. Our small children from six weeks onwards and our aged people up to 80 years are definitely not able to withstand the hardship of living under such circumstances. In the whole empire, no children, women or old people are interned at all and to our knowledge, no Jewish refugees are interned in the Commonwealth of Australia. The argument was persuasive but it was also useless. In spite of their bitter disappointment and frustration, the internees set about making the most of camp life. They shared the chores and drew up rosters. My father's drawings illustrated camp life. He drew on every scrap of paper he could find, including airmail paper, envelopes, and even toilet paper. Two trained kindergarten teachers set up a kindergarten and I'm in the front of this photo of a happy group of children. We had plenty of playmates and could wander freely and safely around the camp. But the older children had to leave their parents and went to school in Melbourne. One of my father's jobs was to chop the wood for the fires and as he had no other tools, he used an axe to carve this amazing head. He also persuaded the camp commandant to allow him to go outside the barbed wire perimeter fence to carve an over life size sculpture from the fallen limb of a gum tree. Again, he used only his axe as there were no other tools. The mother and child figure he'd carved was brought into the camp and the children used to dance around it singing Ring a ring of roses. This photo of our family was taken by the camp nurse, Sister Burns. A few of Carl's sculptures are out the front of our hut, and you can also see the top of the mother and child figure. But the loss of freedom weighed heavily on my father, and most of his drawings show the barbed wire perimeter fence. It was as if this was the limit of our existence the world beyond totally out of reach.
My father joined the army in April 1942. Before long, my mother and I also went to Melbourne. We had a small room in a boarding house in Park Street, St Kilda. Carl's urge to create art was unstoppable. In the army, instead of handing in the potatoes he was peeling to the kitchen, he carved these three figures. And in this one, you can clearly see the eye of the potato at the back of the head. In 1946, six years after our arrival in Australia as enemy aliens, we finally became Australian citizens. In Australia, after the war, it was very difficult to earn a living from art. So both my parents became art teachers in private school. Carl at Mentone and Grammar and Slava at St. Catherine's. At the same time, Carl established his professional career as a sculptor. He was always inspired by the story of Moses, in particular Exodus 19, 1 to 32. Moses is so angry that the Jews are worshipping the golden calf that he smashes the tablets of the law onto the ground. First exhibited in the Victorian Sculptor Society exhibition in 1956, it won the prestigious Victorian Sculptor of the Year Award for Carl and was subsequently acquired by the National Gallery of Victoria. It was also exhibited in the Olympic Games Arts Exhibition in the same year. This success opened many doors for Carl and in the late 1950s and through the 1960s, he had a number of important commissions. Next slide, please. This image again demonstrates Carl's interest in biblical subjects, this time Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. A ceramic bas-relief, it was commissioned for the main hall of the popular reception centre, Stanmark, and is now located in the municipal offices of the city of Glenira, Melbourne. Apart from working on his personal career, in 1962, Carl was instrumental in establishing the first Jewish Artist Society in Melbourne and became the founding president. The newspaper clipping shows Carl at the 1962 opening of the first exhibition of this organization with the director of the National Gallery, Eric Westbrook, and other well-known artists and, and identities, including Professor Zelman Kahn, later Sir Zelman Kahn, Governor General of Australia. Adjacent is a letter written by Anton Hanuk in 1925. In this letter, Hanuk supports Carl's idea to establish a Jewish artist society in Vienna, which indicates that Carl was already thinking about this as a young student. Carl's Carlton War Memorial is at the Melbourne General Cemetery and forms part of a menorah designed by the architect Anthony Hayden. The bronze relief was commissioned by the Jewish community in 1963 and the Holocaust is commemorated at this site every year. In the following ABC film, you will see Carl in the relief, with the relief in his studio in East Melbourne. This recently found archival footage was filmed in 1963 and has just been digitized. Carl is walking to the studio and our dog at the time is following him. We always had a dog. And he, he's um, going in, the studio has just been built at this point and I was living in Europe. So he's going in to look at this bronze relief close up and you'll get excellent footage of the relief in detail. And it, as you can see, it's extremely poignant beautifully rendered in bronze.
It really doesn't need my commentary. He then, after this, continues his stroll in this in this new studio, and you see the mask which we had earlier in in the webinar, and a mon a a wood wood carving which is in the National Gallery, and other key works, a portrait of me, and then he walks across the new museum, and he looks at a newspaper image which tells the story of me actually winning the national champions of the Nether Netherlands in 1962. And this is reported in the papers here. And that's a portrait of me. And that's the end of the webinar. This menorah, which we're going to see next on the screen, was commissioned for the Israeli embassy in Canberra. And it was commissioned by the Jewish community in New Zealand in 1966. Carl's pictured with the Israeli ambassador, Mr. David Tesher and his wife. The menorah is made up of 42 ceramic tiles, each individually decorated with symbolic motives. And underneath another five tiles spell out the Hebrew letters for Israel. The embassy is in Tirana Street, Yarralumla, and Carl's menorah can be seen from the street front. It was, however, his next commission, the Hakoa Monument to Jewish Sportsmen Killed in the Holocaust, that was to be the climax of his career. Carl was the goalkeeper for the famous Viennese Hakoa football team in the early 1920s and had traveled all over Europe as well as to Egypt and Palestine with the team. Even though he lived on the other side of the world, the post-war leadership of the World Hakoa Movement and the Maccabi World Union facilitated this commission. The over life-size figure Dawn was modeled in Carl's studio and cast in Melbourne. At the time, it was the largest sculpture cast in this city. It generated a great deal of media interest as it was also unheard of for an Australian sculptor to undertake an international commission. The bronze figure was exhibited in Turak Gallery, Melbourne, in the presence of the Israeli ambassador and other dignitaries. In this next image, Carl can be seen on the far left, while in the center, uh, Morris Ashkenazi QC, President of the Executive Council of Australian Jewry, and Simka Pratt, the Israeli ambassador to Australia. The Israeli ambassador, speaking about the work at the unveiling, said, Diplomats practice the art of the, of the possible. It is left to the men of the stature of Karl Dulwig to practice the art of the infinite and sublime symbolizing the miracle of survival and the triumphant emergence of the Jewish people. It is in the finest tradition of commemorative art stemming from Rodin. The figure was shipped to Israel. Karl and Slava followed and Karl installed the work on site in the Maccabi village in Ramat Gan, Israel. This report in Mariv tells the story of Karl and of the monument. In the adjacent image, we can see the sculpture being hoisted into its final resting place. The cairn-like base was constructed from Jerusalem stones and symbolized the destruction of European Jewry. The figure symbolizes a new dawn for the Jewish people in Israel. The opening coincided with the 20th anniversary of the establishment of the State of Israel. The inscription read, erected by Brit Hakoa in 1909 to the memory of Jewish sportsmen, victims of the Holocaust. This stained glass window is in the Melbourne Hebrew Congregation Synagogue. Inspired by the Western Wall in Jerusalem, it was commissioned by Rabbi Rappaport to commemorate, to commemorate his parents. The day after it was installed on the 27th of August, 1969, 
Rabbi Rappaport wrote to Carl. This window is a worthy memorial to my parents because it depicts the most precious relic in our life of faith and because the design has been so beautifully put into reality by yourself. In 1972, Carl completed a commission for another synagogue. The new Elwood, Torah, Elwood Talmud Torah in Melbourne was designed by the architect Kurt Popper, also a European emigre, who designed many buildings for the Jewish community. The hand-beaten copper relief is titled Sunburst. At the age of 70, Carl can be seen at the top of the ladder putting the finishing touches to this work. In 1972, Carl also collaborated with the emigre architect Robert Roche on the new Kadima Cultural Center in Elstonwick, Melbourne. Carl's works of art for this building have been classified by the National Trust Victoria. They consist of a ceramic bar relief on the facade, which you have on your screen now, two stained glass windows in the main hall and six memorial windows in the memorial hall. Slava helped Carl select the antique glass and she also documented the commission. We have detailed images to follow. So the candle of hope, the menorah, youth and a new dreamland, flowers, and the Star of David, the Bird of Peace, the martyrs who passed through hell and the the martyrs who passed through hell and the hor so horrors of war, and the final slide, sun appearing through dark clouds. Carl was still working into his eighties. His last commission was for a monument to Raoul Wallenberg in 1985. Commissioned by the Free Wallenberg Organization, it was one of the first monuments to Wallenberg erected anywhere in the world. The monument is at Kew Junction, one of Melbourne's busiest intersections. My mother Slava passed away in 1975 and Carl in 1986. In 2003, I facilitated the establishment of the Dulwick Studio, Museum and Sculpture Garden, consisting of the former residence and artist studio of my parents in East Melbourne, as well as their works of art, custom built furniture from, saved from Vienna and many other precious items. Lyndall Wisher, the director of the Dulwick Studio and Janet Art, Aunt, a museum guide, will tell you more about the work of our organization. In closing, and uh, I draw your attention to the uh, video, to the screen now, and I hope you will all look at the various things that you see there after I, we finish. Um, in closing, however, I would like to quote the words of the journalist Pamela Ruskin, who wrote the following about my father's work. The community should realize that here, held for eternity in bronze, stone, glass, and clay, is the story of Jewish survival, hope, and faith in the very abyss of terror. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you very much, Eva, for that wonderful talk and for our brief introduction. I would like to acknowledge the country on which I live and work, the Kulin nations that surround and are part of Melbourne and their elders, both past, present and emerging. I'd like to thank everyone for the opportunity to speak today at this Danira Association webinar and for Emmanuel Synagogue for their support in presenting the webinar today. The focus of my talk is the work that we do at the studio with an emphasis on interpreting the art of Carl Duldi to inspire creative journeys, which is the museum's mantra.
The history of the museum and its establishment has been briefly summarized by Eva. So established around 2003, we hold over 7,000 items in the collection. This is representative of both Carl and Slava's creative output, but the fact that we are also a house museum holding all original household artifacts. We work with a small specialist team of staff, contractors, volunteers, and a, and a board. The museum consists of the original home, a gallery, the artist's studio that you saw in that wonderful black and white ABC footage, a small workshop, and a sculpture garden. In terms of our core activities, it is much as you would expect for Australian public museum and galleries, museums and galleries ar around the state and across the nation. We present exhibitions, we do outreach work, audience engagement, we have digital offerings, many of which have increased during the time of COVID and business development. Our target audiences are very, very varied. And so I'm going to take a moment to describe them. They include our local community, which is Stonington in Victoria, special interest groups, European emigres, museums and galleries, both in Australia and overseas, families, young people, creatives, supporters, community leaders, art enthusiasts and students many of whom you can see represented at this special event. And in terms of the in international connections that we have, I wanted to take a moment to emphasize that this year, we are very pleased to work with Gerhard Marx House in Bremen, Germany, and their director, Dr. Ari Hartog, who will present the annual Duldig Lecture later this month. The next set of slides show highlights from the programs we present for the enrichment of our local and wider community. You see here an adult art class, and it's one of the most wonderful photos I think we've taken in recent times. The group is called self-titled Ladies with Attitude, and you can see that they are enjoying very much being in our small workshop. And here they're handling clay and the emphasis here is not the outcome, but just the process of being together and learning about this text, this very tactile medium. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Children are also attending similar workshops and the ethos at the studio is to give them as much freedom to work with their imagination as possible. Events such as family days are very important. The museum is a site that is accessible to a broad audience and it brings together community members and supporters at one time. This photo is in the sculpture garden and at the forefront of the image, you see the wonderful bronze of Corey. Next slide, please. New connections with living artists are made each month and each year, such as with this indigenous elder and master weaver, Auntie Bronwyn Razum, a Gunditjmara lady, who visited the studio in 2019. This was part of a program called Creative Women in Focus. The program was inspired by the art and contribution of Slava Duldik, the wife of Karl. Here we see Eva on the left, Auntie Bronwyn centrally, and a participant to the right. Next slide, please. Group tours for adult learners are one of our most regular programs. You can see here a group of adult cyclists who have stopped and will be taken on a tour of the studio and the gallery. The guides you see are at the left of the image and they are a very important part of what we do. Jenny and Andrew pictured here are key contributors to our program and the Dordic Studio could not work without the contribution of a wonderful core of volunteers. Next slide. 
A schools program is offered to both public and private schools from the local and wider regions. This creates access to the studio's resources and activities. It enriches students' learning through engaging with art at a very close level and also through our unique cultural venue. Collection care is critical to what we do and we do this through research, display and interpretation. I have mentioned there are 7,000 plus items. So there is a huge amount of cultural material for us to display for the benefit of the public. The images you see here of, from a new exhibition that I have curated with a team entitled The Studio of Carl Dulde, A Living Legacy. And you can see that Eva was positioned in front of this very exhibition today. It interprets, it interprets the stages of Carl's studio practice, both starting as a young man in Europe, right through to his time in Malvern East in Melbourne, Victoria. We explore his tools and techniques, how he made work, and we try to demystify some of the um, artist's secrets in terms of how large work and bronze work and public commissions are made. This is new interpretation for new audiences, and it includes an essay on bronze work made by Carl that was written by Dr. Jane Eckert, who is a research fellow at the University of Melbourne. Next slide, please. The Dordic Studio Gallery Program does form an opportunity to highlight collection strengths. To the left we see in this new show that I have mentioned, some, what, some throne work made on a potter's wheel. Carl did this with the help of his wife Slava to help effectively make ends meet as the family re-established a creative life in Melbourne after leaving the camp in Tatura. You see here some beautifully thrown work and hand decorated with underglaze and a clear overglaze. To the right, we see some bronze figures. This is a selection of work that shows how adaptable Carl's artistic hand was. Next slide, please. Another key element of what the studio does today to retain relevance in today's society is community outreach. Many museums and galleries do this and Dulwich Studio stands apart in the quality and authenticity of what it offers. Pictured here are senior people at Emmy Monash Aged Care, which is an aged care facility supporting the well-being and health of Jewish senior citizens. Again, much like the ladies with attitude image I showed earlier, the expression on these participants' faces, I think tells a thousand words about the joy of what they are experiencing. And again, the value of this wonderful tactile medium of clay that, um, that Carl used and taught many people during his lifetime. Next slide, please. The continu to continue this legacy of teaching and learning, we embrace the work of our curator, Stefan Dumsch. He is seen here tutoring young people in the workshop. You can see him to the left with a young boy and the care and concern he has for this young participant as these young people are tutored in hand building techniques. Stefan was a pupil and also a techni technician for Carl Dulde. So it is in him that we have evidence of a very important living legacy at the museum. To conclude, I have an image here taken at a soiree in the gallery space. To the far left, there is a silent star of this image. It is the Steinway piano. This is a family heirloom 
and it sits in the gallery space for concerts and sing-alongs. To the right, we see Janet, who is going to speak. And I think this image, amongst many, is great evidence of the rich cultural history within our museum. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Lyndall, for the introduction. Just waiting for Rob to catch up. This, yes, um, the image that, that uh, Lyndall just showed you is the fact that I do some entertaining also as another sideline of what I do. But I'm also a guide and I love to be involved in the Dulwich Studio because of my parents' personal connection with Singapore, leaving Germany in 38 and then coming to Tatura as well. And the other thing I enjoy much is that my great grandfather was a marble sculptor back in Germany and my family were monumental masons. And so the tools my dad brought with him to out of Germany to Australia also on occasions were given to Carl to use. So that's my connection with the Dulwich Studio. So as a guide, I also enjoy showing people around the house. This image is of some furniture in the living room. Slava helped design this furniture when she had uh, invented the folding umbrella, as you saw, with some of the royalties, she was able to purchase some furniture and, and help in the design as well of this particular furniture in the living room. The curtain at the back is not from Vienna, but it is from George's in Melbourne. So she had bought some material when they bought the house in 1952 so that she could uh, use the colour scheme for the living room. Next slide, please. This furniture is a Chinese cabinet reminiscent of one that they would have had in Singapore. As you know, the Dordigs lived in Singapore and they established themselves very well for the little time that they had there as um, art teachers and having their own art business and so on and so forth. And so they were able to have quite a good life in Singapore, unfortunately, when the shutters were pulled down in 1940, saying you had to leave. They could not bring their furniture as such as you see with them but they could bring some mementos, as you see in the middle there. This piece of Chinese furniture was bought in Melbourne as part payment for some art restoration work they did for Joshua McClellan here in Melbourne. And Eva tells us there was a little bit of a mother of pearl shell missing on one of these doors, and she and her mum went down to St Kilda Beach to get some mother of pearl shell to replace the missing bits. Next slide, please. While they were in Singapore, they had a good life as Europeans, as you can imagine, and Carl, being a tennis player that he was, joined the tennis club there. And this young boy, this Malay boy, was one of the ball boys in the tennis club. And as a tribute to him, Carl made, first of all, a plaster cast and then a bronze. And the story goes that one of the bronzes that was made went missing in Singapore for many, many years. And it was discovered a few years ago and there was a new art gallery opening in Singapore and that bronze that was found was put into the new gallery. Eva was there for the opening of that gallery and I was there a year later and it was a great thrill to see that in the gallery. Next slide, please. Okay, so this, this bronze is part of the potato sculptures. You saw the, the plaster casts. This is in the sunroom, a little sort of add-on room which was part of the house the Californian bungalow. So from, from um, clay, from, from potato, I beg your pardon, to plaster, to bronze. And so while Carl was on kitchen duty when he was in the army, as you were told, he actually probably got a bit bored with peeling potatoes. And so he used his knife and he started whittling. And as a result of that, we have these wonderful sculptures today that we enjoy so much. Next slide. Out in the garden, in the sculpture garden at the back, we have many sculptors. This lady is actually Wendy Chuckus, who is our volunteer coordinator. She's holding a map of the garden with all the sculptures there that one of our internees did. The sculpture on her left is of Captain Charles Young, who was the army padre 
to the eighth employment company. Carl was part of that for several months. And Charles Young became very good friends with the Dooligs and he was instrumental in helping them when they were able to leave the camp. When the men were enlisted into the army in 1942, they were able to leave the camp. And so Charles Young was one of those people who helped find accommodation and employment for the Dooligs and they were friends for quite a while after that also. This is the entrance to the studio as you saw before. Carl had this built in 1962. On the outside there we see a few things like sculptures and a few slabs of um, marble and granite. As you know, Carl also did the murals and so forth and he actually sourced those particular pieces himself and he made the tiles for those murals that you saw earlier on. Next sculpture. Captain Charles Broughton, what, Tip Broughton was part Maori. When the men were drafted or conscripted into the army in 1942 as enemy, enemy aliens, they were actually reclassified as refugee aliens. And Captain Broughton said, I will take charge of the boys, as he called them. Tip was his nickname. Edward Broughton was his real name. So he became their NCO. He was very sympathetic to the men and their religious backgrounds. He learned a bit of German. He respected the Jewish holidays. He gave fellows a leave pass to go to Melbourne for Shabbat. But of course, the young men also enjoyed the times when they could go to the dances on a Saturday night. Captain Broughton is buried in Faulkner Cemetery and some of his family came to a memorial service a few years ago to attend that service at the Faulkner Cemetery. Next slide, please. This is me and one of my duties as a guide, looking at some of the sculptures outside, particularly like this one, because it just shows the warmth of feeling that Carl had the, the physical connection to people and to with their friends or their loved ones. And so I really enjoy showing those particular pieces because they're quite intimate. And um, uh, the pieces in the garden are mostly terracotta pieces. There are a few bronzes, but and some of them are reminiscent of time in Singapore with ladies in sarongs and carrying things on their heads. Next slide, please. That might be the end, I think. Can I just say at the end, thank you for inviting me to speak to you today. But I would also like to add that Eva told me that when the men went out to work, like picking grapes or fighting bushfires or canning fruit at Ardnona, um, they would sing this song as they went on their way. Wish me luck as you wave me goodbye. Cheerio, here I go on my way. Wish me luck as you wave me goodbye. With a cheer, not a tear, make it gay. Give me a smile I can keep all the while in my heart while I'm away. Till we meet once again, you and I. Wish me luck as you wave me goodbye. Thank you, everyone. Oh, my goodness. Thank you. That was absolutely wonderful. Thank, Thank you so me. much, Janet. Thank, Thank you. you. I need to, uh, a few apologies. I think with the, um, the wonderful, uh, technology that we have at our disposal can sometimes also be a detriment. And I apologize, but I have to thank you, Eva, for just true consummate professional and just sort of taking on and over. Um, and I know that we did have a problem with the video. Um, I was on the phone as you were all online with, um, with our technical support who could hear it perfectly but unfortunately we couldn't hear it so what i will we, we will be doing is that post this event i have all the attendees um email addresses so we're going to send out all the links um any links to the dual dig studio to the um to the video that you didn't get to hear unfortunately um to eva's book um, and I do would like to open it up now, if anybody has any questions, if you wouldn't mind, I think you were so enthralled that nobody actually sent any questions in yet, but if you wouldn't mind sending any questions, if you have, and, and the questions can be for either Eva or Linda or, or Janet. Um, and um, we look forward to uh, 
to having that Eva while we're waiting for some questions a little bit about the book I was reading Driftwood 2017 was that correct that's right um, and um, so a little bit about the book because I think you said that it's not it's it's as much about the past as it is the future yes well uh, Driftwood has been, was a work that I started some 45 50 years ago <laughs> after my mother died as I realized that there was an, an, a fascinating story the family story really was unique as much our escape which we already have dealt on perhaps today but in particular in this in this setting and where I'm sitting now uh, where I have around me some of the furniture and so and all the works of art that were actually saved uh, under remarkable circumstances in Europe and which through the skill of my mother, the foresight of my mother and the generosity and love of my aunt, her sister, who with her husband hid everything in a Paris cellar uh, during the war under threat of Nazis all around them and not having enough money for food or anything else. And then uh, this was saved by these wonderful people in Paris between uh, before till the end of the war. And then my mother discovering that her only relative alive anywhere in the world was her sister in Paris. And at the same time, discovering that everything from the Viennese apartment had been saved. And that I think is a miracle. And it was, it is mm -hmm. that miracle which has prompted me and encouraged me and inspired me to keep the museum intact, to keep the works intact, and eventually, thank goodness, to write the book, to get it published, because that was always my intention. Mm. Absolutely. Um, Eva, I just wanted to ask you a question. Do you have many memories of the camp? My first memories are in the camp, actually. And I do remember a birthday party that I had where a flower was pinned onto my head. I must have been four. And one of my other little friends in that photo, which you saw, obviously was jealous or something like that. And he <laughs> came up to me and he pulled out this flower. <laughs> and Who was that, Eva? I burst into tears. And I remember that very clearly. And one or two other little events and things. So they're kind of fleeting memories. But as everyone knows, you know, sometimes you remember things because other people speak about them. Course, and that yes. also happens to me in that context. Mm. <laughs> I think one of the other questions, Eva, are the, um, the beautiful sculptures behind yourself and also Lyndall. Um, if either you or Lyndall would, would mind speaking about those. Right. Well, Lyndall, do you want me to do it or are you? Well, have... I've got an idea. Let me comment on the ones in your picture and you comment on the ones in mine. All right. How about that? That's a good idea. <laughs> you don't mind. <laughs> I'll just get out of the way. Look. Oh, you want me to start? Okay. Well, behind Lyndall um, is, is a, a fascinating archival photo we have in the collection and it shows Karl's marble works, which he completed under Anton Hanak at the Kunstwerk of Abishula, which I mentioned. And this photo was taken in his family's home in Kirchengasse, Vienna. And he was still living at home at the time when the sculptures were made. And obviously the family had given him space to set up these sculptures. Now, all of those sculptures are here in this museum. And that is the miracle I was speaking about. And even in this instance, there's on the right, you can see a turntable, the, far, the one sort of fourth from the left. And we have that turntable here in the studio as well. So um, each of these pieces were carved direct into the stone with uh, stone carving uh, chisels and hammers. And Anton Hanak advised his students or mentored them and told them, carve direct into your stone, don't have a maquette or drawing. That kind of explains it a little bit, I think, Lindor. Mm -hmm. And you, yeah. would you like to have a go at what's behind me? I'll move. Uh, sure. Uh, sure, sure. So yes, it's um, it's a pleasure to be able to comment on this. These works, and you've seen this a little bit throughout each presentation, are terracotta. So it's a fired. Obviously, this uh, rich, warm brown color comes up when the clay is fired, and um. 
to, I'm going to start with the work on the right. It's uh, Nofratiti, and you would have seen in my slides, there is also, this was cast into bronze, but in the first instance, it's this clay work. And the thing that interests me is that it's done in around 1970, and this is just after Kyle and Slava have a, uh, a major international trip. So they go to Israel in 60, around 68 for the launch of the Dawn sculpture, which we heard about. And they also then take time to see um, different museums and galleries around Europe and reconnect with sites they haven't seen um, for many, many decades. Then when they come back, Carl enters, I think, in, uh, up to me, a decade in the 70s of great production, new work, new ideas. Um, and the uh, reference to this Egyptian form is one that he started his interest in as a very young man when he was playing soccer with the Hakoa team. So uh, the story that some of you will know is that Carl was a gifted sportsman as well as an artist. And I think at one point really made a choice about what he would pursue. So young meaning perhaps 19, 20 years of age, this team went over to Egypt to play competitive soccer. And it was there with his team that Carl took photographs of um, the beautiful sculpture from ancient Egypt. Then when he's, um, as an older man, touring in museums, he sees these um, works from Egyptian history again. Then back in Australia, he starts to manifest that in his work. And we also see it in the middle, um, middle work there with these very angular forms, um, blocky forms that to me refer to um, ancient artwork. Then on the far left, and we don't see the whole work, we see a very different work again, and it's, it's abstracted. We, um, thank you, Eva. So we also see that Carl, and this is something I really like about him as an artist, moves with the times. We see negative space in his work, and we see that in Nofratiti. We see this abstracted piece and uh, but very carefully crafted. So he starts to starts to tune in to what's happening with modern and postmodern trends in Australia around the world. And um, I think the abstract piece you see on the left is is quite rare, but you do see some of those forms in his works in the late 60s and 70s. So the exhibition that we have put on um, and will be opening very soon when it's safe to do so in post COVID times. We'll show you the traditional work that you saw in Eva's image, so Viennese sculpted work, right through to what happened in Australia. And the other concluding comment I'll make is that in Australia, Carl did explore and use many different mediums. And I think he did this not only because he wanted to and had the ability, but also because he had to. He started using clay a lot in Singapore. It was a warmer climate there. And he did start sculpting bus, portrait bus in clay. Um, in Australia, more materials again enter his body of work and he starts to refine his technique. And he's someone who as an artist likes to keep for the audience to see where his hands have been on the work. And this is another wonderful thing. When you see his work in person, you do get an intuitive sense of the hand of the artist. So I think I'll, I'll leave my comments there for the moment, Marina. Thank you so much, Lyndall. And Lyndall, a question that was asked was, are there any other Jewish artists contemporary to Carl, uh, for example, Ola Kahn, who are represented in the gallery? Oh, that's a very good question. The Dordic collection is dedicated to the production of work by Karl and Slava. Uh, if there's anything else held, it is sometimes perhaps the odd gift given to, given to the couple or the individual artists, or perhaps an artifact given to Eva. Our remit is definitely to preserve, conserve, interpret, and present the work of the, um, the Duldig family, and particularly, of course, Carl's major achievements. Interestingly mm -hmm. though, um, it is not to say that Carl didn't engage with a wider group of artists. And 
it was very important to note what Eva was saying in terms of his leadership roles beyond his own practice. So leadership roles in education, leadership roles starting a, a society for Jewish artists. In 1972, he achieves the major Kadima commission through his networks. He's invited to do that as by then an elder statesman in the Australian art world in Melbourne. And so I think we must remember, and I am always inspired by this, that both Carl and Slava had a strong presence in their wider community. And we continue that as much as we can. And it is part of why we do our outreach work with schools, both mm. Jewish and non-Jewish schools, with aged care facilities, both Jewish and non-Jewish, with senior people who come to us from all around Australia and overseas to see what we do. So that, that ethos of showing leadership beyond one's practice is something I think we achieve really well. And we part of how we do it is working with people such as Janet um, and people who have a living memory and a desire to share those memories with audiences. That's wonderful. Thank you very much, Lyndall, for sharing that with us. Now, Eva, one of the um, questions that somebody has sent across is that whether um, the Duldi family had more relations who may not have been as lucky to go to Australia and were left in Europe. Mm. I, I briefly dealt, dealt with that when I said that um, the on my mother's side, the only person who survived on her side was her sister who married a Frenchman and managed to survive in Paris. On my father's side, a few of the family managed to go west. That is like, like us. They traveled actually to, through Singapore and to Australia. That's my father's older brother. Oldest brother did that. However, his second brother and, uh, and, he, and his mother and that family went back to Poland and were shot in Pshamysil in 1942. Um, no, we have uh, uh, virtually a, no family, you could say, or very few. We, I have a few cousins here now from uh, Dr. Leo Dulvik, who was the uh, person who was mentioned in the video mm. as we came through. Mm. And Eva, do you know if um, Carl remained in touch with other artists that he knew in Europe? It was very difficult, of course, Marina. It's nothing like now. Although it is interesting that I've just been writing up a particular sculpture here, the history of it, and it occurred to me that th they did make a reunion in Vienna with one or two people who they actually studied with in Vienna. And that was very moving for them at the time. Of course, you have to understand that some 30, 35 years later, when they went in 1968, um, they actually did pick up a few artists in Vienna who they knew. But otherwise, no, there was no communication and it was, of course, extremely difficult at the time. I think, I think uh, that, um, sorry, yes, no, go ahead, Lyndall. Well, I was just going to mention, um, it's an opportunity to say, when I mentioned the museum, Gerhard Marx House, that mm. is found, Gerhard Marx was a modernist sculptor whose artistic career was also shattered by World War II. And um, part of what that director, Ari Hardog, is doing is finding the links between the artists in terms of their, in terms of a world historical context. So what he's going to do in his talk um, later this month is compare the artists. So one was a modernist artist in Berlin and one Karl in Vienna, and he's going to compare and contrast those um, those artists, what they went through, what it meant. Um, one artist stayed in uh, Germany and Carl obviously came to Australia. So something we do do, if we can, is find our peers and find our like stories, both nationally and internationally. Um, and one of the things that can happen too in the work we do is um, the design elements of the studio, such as the chairs that were in uh, Janet's slide that are Bauhaus inspired and were um, Yare chairs with design inputs from Slava and the Bauhaus movement. They also allow us to link to scholarly work and um, peers who are working in this realm as well. And to, up to a point, it's not the same, but up to a point, it bridges the gap 
that has occurred, as Eva said, because of the tragedy of the outcomes of World War II, loss of life and loss of contact. So the current work um, sometimes is able to build a bridge, creating knowledge that is shared from different parts of the globe to continue to inspire and educate people. No, that's wonderful. Thank you, Lyndall. And Eva, um, we talked about Slava um, and um, we know that she's done some amazing abstract painting in her later years. Um, is there a particular reason that she, she did those um, since they are different from the portraits that she did in the early years? Well, um, both my parents moved with the times and artists never stay still, Marina. So uh, if you are an artist, you might learn how to do things academically. But as you go, your whole imagination moves and you perhaps change where you live and your mediums change and your, the friends you have change and everything changes and the art changes. And that's why we've got Picasso also in the beginning doing very academic work, but later on expanding into all kinds of abstracts. And my parents lived through that very vibrant 20th century. And given the education they had in Vienna, which was quite remarkable because they were the students of secessionist artists, they were able to take that learning and, and it enabled them to take themselves further into all kinds of different styles and different mediums here. Mm. No, amazing. And the um, the wonderful terracotta sculptures that are in the garden, and this is a, a, a question that somebody asked, is do they fade with the sunlight? <laughs> I saw that question and I sort of had a bit of a laugh. Um, well, terracotta is like your terracotta tiles on your roof, and they, of course, are impervious to sunlight. However, there is lichen growing on some of those sculptures. And we are kind of thinking about, do we clean them? And some of them have been cleaned over the years and then they come up this brilliant terracotta like we have in this mm. museum here behind me. Or do we leave them to take their organic path, much as my father would have left them. But because it's a museum and because the intention is to conserve, we, that is the principal motivation. So if we want to conserve it for posterity, we probably should undertake general cleaning regularly to keep them kind of in their more pristine state, if that can, if that can be understood. So the terracotta yes. is terracotta looking instead of having all sorts of growths on it. <laughs> Uh, I understand. Now, Eva, um, I think one of the questions was for whether you are artistic. I thought that was a good one too. Thank you to the person who asked. That's very kind. <laughs> um, I have uh, I have created this museum, and I think that is my legacy. And writing, I love my writing, and writing the book was a joy as well as a, a kind of thing I had to accomplish. And in that way, my creative elements take their path. But I never really was, I didn't think I had the skills to be a, a fine artist like my parents. And I certainly never had the compulsion. And I think that's what it boils down to. You have to be compelled to be the artist that you are capable of being, like Janet loves her singing. And so it, it's just, it just has to be part of you. You can't force these things. And obviously that was not for me. And so I turned my creativity into other things. And then of course, as a young person, I must've been creative on the tennis court. So. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. I think that, um, Look, it's been an absolutely wonderful uh, webinar. And there are a few more things that I just wanted to say rather than, and a small question, I think that during the COVID restrictions that um, we've been having, is the um, studio open um, during the uh, restrictions? I can, yeah. well, I can try and help yes, answer this. So we've been um, obviously very affected by restrictions. What we are hoping to do, we hope in December, is open by appointment. And then what I would like to say to everyone still um, with us today is that in February, 2021, 
February 2, we will open in a COVID safe manner. And this will involve Tuesdays and Thursdays, one to three, the middle Sunday of the month and for special events and workshops and tours. So we are very much looking forward to opening um, Janet's waving her arms hysterically with happiness. The, we're very much looking forward to a COVID safe opening in very early 2021. And for anyone who is uh, really keen to find out more, we've alluded to our website. I'm very happy to be contacted. My contact details are on our website. And if someone really needed or wanted to have a specialised, very small tour, we think from mid-December, we can organise that. Uh, our mm -hmm. museum is shut for the month of January, so we've got time there to gear up to, to welcoming everyone back. And what, I, it just leads to the comment too, Marina, that it's part of why we were delighted to be part of today. We've all had to pivot and adapt to our circumstances. Mm -hmm. And when we were invited to do this, I took it up because I thought, well, that's a great way to continue to reach people while we are in these restricted, challenging times. Victoria is lightening up and uh, people are on the streets again. Galleries are opening. So, um, yeah, just please go to our website to look at updates for when we can, when we will welcome you back. And the 26th of... Um the 26th of November is the Daldic Lecture. Lyndall, could you give everyone a bit of more detail about that? Uh, well, sure. And then um, I'm mindful uh, Marina probably wants to conclude. But look, this talk, I'm talking about Ari Hartog in Bremen. We run this lecture annually. It is a way of interpreting sculpture to new audiences. It's an online webinar. And Dr. Gerard Vaughan will introduce Ari. Uh, many of you may know he was the former director of the National Gallery of Victoria and the Australian National Gallery in Canberra. He will introduce Ari. Ari was born in the Netherlands and now works in Germany. He's a sculpture expert and I really strongly recommend tuning in to listen. This is a free event for anyone who'd like to log on. Please go to our website and you'll find out how to register. I will provide a brief introduction to that event and we would love you to come along. I think it will be fascinating and it will give insight, as I said, to Gerhard Marx and his work, who also was an artist sculpting in bronze and different mediums, and who has also had a museum founded in his name. And it will draw some connections to what we do here in Australia at Dildy Studio. Thank you, thank you. Lindell. And um, I did want to thank everybody today. Before we conclude, um, there was a special thanks and gratitude to um, Eva um, and Janet for including, um, from Suzanne, for including her uncle, Captain Edward Broughton, tip. Um, so that was a really lovely thank you. I think as um, she was saying that they've spent much time preserving and collecting his photos, history, and including his, his Maori whanau. Um, which is very relevant to what a dignified man he was. So thank you to you both. And I did want to say thank you once again. Thank you, Janet. Thank you, Lyndall. Eva, it's been an absolute pleasure. And um, Ron from the Denaire Association is always a wonderful, wonderful pleasure to, um, to work alongside you and at this stage to work alongside the Dual Dig Studio to present to you all this fabulous webinar. We will, as I said, be sending out um, information with the links, um, but please go along to the website for the Dual Dig Studio. Um, and once again, from myself, as I said, I'm Marina, I'm the Programming Director at Emmanuel Synagogue. We'd like to thank you very, very much for attending today's webinar. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Marina. Thank you very thank much, Marina. Thank you so much. Well, thank Ron. you. First of all, Can I hand it over to you, Ron. Amazing uh, pr um, professional presentation by Eva, Jan and Lyndall. Uh, it was absolute pleasure. I'd like to thank Emmanuel Synagogue Sydney for agreeing to co-host this event, which has enabled us to reach a far wider audience than otherwise would have been possible. Particularly, I thank Marina Capone and Communications Director Rob Klein for their hard work to make this event possible, as well as Eva de Jong Duldig for allowing us to use the life and works of her father, Carl Duldig, as the raison d'etre for this event. Thank you to all participants. Without you, it would not be a success. Thank you. Thanks, Ron. Thank you. Thanks, Thank Ron. you.